Welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast, conversations with today's top ministry leaders to help you lead better every day. And now podcasting from scenic Colorado Springs, Colorado, here's your host, Jason Day. Hello, friends, and welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast. I am your host, Jason Day, and this week I connected with Greg Steer, the founder and CEO of Dare to Share Ministries. Dare to Share has equipped over a million teenagers and adults to regularly and passionately share the hope of Jesus with others. Greg has written over a dozen books, including Gospelize Your Youth Ministry. He speaks across the globe, and he oversees Dare to Share Live, which is an incredible one-day evangelism training event that, that really equips teenagers to start a gospel revolution in their own communities. Now, in this episode, Greg responds to some recent research about young people walking away from their faith. Greg and I also discuss why pastors need to prioritize youth ministry and how it is uniquely positioned to ignite evangelism in our communities. Greg shares specific biblical values which are consistently found in healthy gospel advancing ministries. Incredible and very helpful insights from Greg. I love his passion. I love his experience and appreciate his wisdom. So now won't you please join me in my conversation with Greg Steer. Welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast, Greg Steer. It's great to have you with us, brother. Jason, glad to be on with you. Awesome. I'm excited because we had the opportunity to really dive into uh, something that's near and dear to my heart as a father of six and as a former youth minister uh, when I started in ministry. um, Great years to look back upon. And that is um, our younger generation and and, um, our teens and and how God is at work um, in them and through them. And I know that is that is your heartbeat, brother. So um, recently there was a report from the T- Pine Tops Foundation, and um, one of the things that they they focused upon was that 35 million young people who were raised in in homes where Christ was proclaimed and Christ was lived out will likely walk away from their faith. Um, in the next 30 years or so, next three decades. So as, as you see and hear those reports coming out, um, what what do you think of, Greg, when, when you hear something like that come out? I think we got to stop that. You know, I mean, you hear these statistics that are just like a punch in the gut, and you're thinking, my goodness, what is happening? And I'm not a stat guy, um, but when I read stats like that, I'm like, okay, we have to get urgent. The time is now. Um, we, we have to reach this next generation. We have to mobilize this next generation. And regardless of whatever stats you read, I mean, it's pretty obvious that Christianity is losing its punch in the United States and that we are, you know, giving way to a post-Christian culture and that something needs to change. And I'm hopeful actually that that will those statistics and others like it will ignite a fire in the hearts of church leaders, parents, and pastors who say we're going to do what it takes. We're going to take you seriously because they're not just the church of tomorrow, but they are the church of today. But our churches tomorrow are going to be empty if we do not reach this next generation. We need a we need that force, you know, that farm club coming in hot. Mm. So I just, I feel like um, that is a big flag. Those statistics and others like it are a big red flag that we are waving and saying, listen, we got to take youth ministry seriously. It's no longer, we can't look at it as a necessary evil. We're beyond uh, pizza and dodgeball and a 10 minute talk. We have to mobilize teenagers to reach their generation for Christ. We got to reframe the Great Commission as the ultimate cause, mm. and we have to raise up an army to yeah. reach this generation. Yeah, uh, and, and Greg, you you make a case for really youth pastors being in an excellent position to to really ignite a fire of evangelism in the church, right? And and you you've made this case, you kind of champion this cause. Um, how do you hold that hope in light of um, such a dire projection? Um, and and the, the, the data and statistics that are coming out. You know, I think God secretly enjoys uh, scary t- statistics so he can show up and show off. <laughs> and 
if you look at the first great awakening, yeah, um, you know, before the United States was the United States. Uh, the, the colonies were a loosely knit, you know, aggregation of former Puritans that kind of became capitalists that were, you know, there was entire villages uh, given over to drunkenness and prostitution. I mean, it was America was a dark place when John Wesley uh, and uh, Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield began to preach. And three years before Whitfield died, according to Eric Metaxas in his book, uh, If You Can Keep It, three years before Whitfield, uh, three years after Whitfield died, the signing of the Declaration of Independence took place, and America was fundamentally transformed into a moral nation. It was ready for a republic. And the reason is because God sparked a youth movement. Mm. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, who was a chief historian of the First Great Awakening, said the revival has been chiefly among the young. And so it was a youth revival that prepared America to be America. And uh, I believe it's going to be a youth awakening that can not not only close the gap on those statistics, but I mean, I call Jesus. He's the great stat blaster. <laughs> and he going to blow those out of the water with the revival. And I'm praying that we do that. And we have, think about it, there's over 300,000 churches in the United States there's 67,342 high schools and middle schools. So we really outnumber schools five to one. And if we can mobilize the church to be the church, actually energize the church to mobilize, you know, teenagers to gospelize their world, uh, we can see evangelism happen faster. Social media, people look at it as a curse. I look at it as a blessing. Mm. Like the gospel can spread through social media. Teenagers can leverage all that of the gospel, but we have to change, youth leaders have to w change the way that they're thinking. And what we're seeing is down deep inside the heart of every youth leader worth his or her salt, there's a burning gospel ember that we just need to find and fan and fuel, give them the right kind of strategy. And it's less, more of a mindset actually than a model. And then they go for it. And man, we're seeing massive momentum and the youth ministries that are taking these principles and values and implementing them in the context of the youth ministry. And they're all rooted in the – all these values are rooted in the book of Acts. We didn't develop anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I want to get to those um, in just a minute because I know that you, your team has, has done great research. Um, you have great insight into youth ministries that um, are actually experiencing kingdom growth. Um, and, and so I really want to get into that. But before we jump in there, um, thinking of, of the pastors and ministry leaders listening in, one of the things that um, is, is kind of often, often said or maybe presumed um, is that the youth pastorate is, is many times used as kind of a stepping stone uh, to another position for, for some ministry leaders. And I would love, Greg, since you work with so many ministry leaders around the country and even around the world, I'd love to hear kind of your your thoughts on that, um, just that kind of generalization and, and what you think about that um, as a whole. Well, you know, I, I used to believe, man, I used to be the guy saying, hey, don't ever use the youth ministry as a stepping stone to the senior pastor unless you know for sure God has called you to do that. And I still believe that you got to know God's called you to do that. But here's the way I look at it is you can get into youth ministry and get out. But if the right kind of youth ministry gets into you, uh, you never get out. You just change your role. So you become a youth, a youth pastor with authority and a budget. Uh, <laughs> you know, a youth pastor disguised as a lead pastor because some of the best lead pastors I know were youth pastors. And what I would encourage is that whatever you do, whether you're called to be a lifer, I think of a guy in Castle Rock, Colorado, he goes by Mr. Bill. This dude is, I think, 56 years old. He's been in youth ministry for over 30 years. He is the best youth leader I know. He will never take a different I mean, job um, unless God actually shows up and says, no, seriously, I want you to take a different job <laughs> uh, because God has called him to this. I also think of uh, a guy named Annie McGowan in Kenosha, Wisconsin, who was a phenomenal gospel advancing youth leader. And guess what? He's uh, now a phenomenal gospel advancing pastor, and he's really helping to lead the youth ministry charge at his own church and in other churches. It's never gotten out of him. Uh, and so I think what we need to do, though, is really make sure 
that we were doing the right kind of youth ministry because I think the typical approach of games and fun and, you know, a little worship and a little Bible study, that there's a reason we're seeing less seniors than juniors, less juniors than sophomores, less sophomores than freshmen in youth ministries is because kids are busy and they don't have time just for fun and games anymore. They, I mean, they're, they're getting ready for college or serious about sports or serious about academics. Uh, we need to get them serious about the greatest cause of all, which is making and multiplying disciples. And if you do that, if you have that philosophy, you'll carry that with you if God calls you into a different role in the church. But if you don't, uh, it's just frustrating. Uh, it's hamster in a wheel approach. Okay, let's do the camp. Let's do the curriculum. Let's do the retreat. Let's do the disciple now weekend. Let's do the camp. Let's do the curriculum. Let's do the retreat. I mean, and our kid, you wake up one day and realize, you know what? My kids are a bunch of narcissistic teenagers that really love Jesus on Sunday, but live for themselves the rest of the week. That's discouraging. Yeah. But when you see kids sold out for a cause, for the king and the cause, and they got a crew to go with, man, you got game, game over. That's a game changer. That's awesome, brother. Let's uh, dive. I, I appreciate your insight on that because, um, and I love just how you frame it. I, lo- I love, I love the fact that you're talking about the idea of you know youth ministry, you know, getting into us, and, and that idea of man, there's an opportunity, regardless of what our role is, to carry that along um, and to champion the younger generations and the gospelizing um, that that you talk about so much. So let's let's dive into um, this idea of what um, gospelizing your youth ministry really looks like and some of these um, key uh, insights and key values that you see in youth ministry where it is most effective when it comes to um, helping them develop as disciples themselves but also develop as disciple makers. So share with us um, some of these these key insights. Yeah, and I'll just share real quick. The word gospelize is the old English word for evangelize. I was I was working out, listening to somebody on an app reading old Charles Spurgeon sermons. Yes, I am a total nerd, <laughs> uh, but I used the word gospelize, and I thought instead of evangelize, and I just thought that's a really cool word. It's a full word. Uh, evangelize sometimes comes with stereotypes, you know, but gospelizing, man, that's just a cool cool term. So. Uh, we did a research project. We found seven values in every gospel advancing or gospelizing youth ministry that was seeing 25% new conversion growth per year or more. Cross-checked it with a thousand pastors from across the United States, from you know Presbyterian to Pentecostal, from urban, suburban to rural. Cross-checked it with the Book of Acts, the Epistles, the Gospels. These seven values are all over the New Testament, and they're hard to find in a typical youth ministry strategy. So we broke it all out in a book called Gospel Your Youth Ministry. We have a website, gospeladvancing.org. And it's, they're simply this. Uh, and again, these were the seven defining characteristics of youth ministries that we're seeing 25% new conversion growth per year, which wow. is impressive. Yeah, yeah. Um, intercessory prayer was the number one defining characteristic, which should not surprise us. But we spend more time in announcements in a typical youth ministry and church, by the way, than in accessory prayer for the lost. Uh, what we found is teenagers that pray for the lost see the lost. They remember the lost. They speak to the lost because they're praying for them, you know. And um, so, you know, those groups prayed for the lost in accessory prayer. Then relational evangelism. Teens were equipped to articulate the gospel, to initiate gospel conversations. They knew how to bring it up because they were trained. They knew how to explain it because they were trained. And again, evangelism training, hard to find in youth ministry. That's what we do at Dare to Share, but we're banging the gospel going all the time and challenging youth leaders. Man, you gotta get your kids equipped. Thirdly, um, leaders fully embraced and modeled it. So uh, the leaders were leading the way for prayer and evangelism and disciple making. Uh, the adult leaders, the youth leaders, and the student leaders. Mm. And, uh, you know, because those are the kids you're putting up or the adults you're putting in front of the kids. I want you to be like this. These are the, these are the examples, right? So if they're not doing it, the kids aren't going to do it. Fourth, a disciple multiplication strategy guides it. So it wasn't just about making converts. It was about making disciples and make disciples. The fifth value was uh, bold vision focuses it. So they had a bold vision 
to reach, you know, across the street, across the tracks, across the world. And they all articulated it differently in different groups, but they all had a big vision outside the walls of their church. Um, the, the sixth one was biblical outcomes measured it. So they measured the right things, was it, which is not attendance. It's things like new conversion growth, what percentage of my kids are growing in their faith, what percentage of my students are actively sharing their faith, et cetera, you know, baptisms, et, things like that. And then the final one, it was ongoing programs reflect it. So they didn't just talk about these values. They put them in their programs. They put them in their ca- on their calendars. They put them in their schedules. So we call that to gospelize. We use the example of uh, Mexican food ingredients. It's all the same, you know, Mexican food. If you listen to Jim Gaffigan, he talks about, you know, Mexican food is all the same ingredients, just remade differently, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And you can can take all these ingredients and bake it and make it differently in the Bronx than you do in Lincoln, Nebraska, than you do in Miami, Florida, than you do in Portland, Oregon. But as long as those ingredients are there, uh, you can customize it and it will work and, you know, it will be delicious to use the, the food analogy. So, um, so that's what we call it. What's what we mean to gospelize a youth ministry? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Greg, let me ask this. Um, as you look at those seven different values, um, and as you work with youth ministers around the country, are, are there any that stand out that you see are, least likely to be showing up in, you know, kind of the average youth group? Prayer. Sadly, Mm. that's the number one response I get when I share this is, oh, dude, I have to pray more. We have to pray more. We're not. And when we do pray, we're not praying for the loss. We're praying for, we're praying for, you know, Aunt Susie's broken hand or somebody to do well on their test. We are not calling out to God on behalf of the lost. And, you know, if you look at it this way, you know, praise is a form of prayer, mm-hmm. right? That's like the rave, you know, that's like the dance party, you <laughs> know. Intercessor, intercessory prayer is like the manual labor of prayer. But what we're starting to see are youth groups literally cutting out a slice of the time in their youth ministry to pray for the lost in the group. And the youth leaders are saying, my goodness, it's, it's opening up their eyes to their lost friends. And the visitors are, to be honest, a little freaked out, but in a good way, like something supernatural is going on here and I'm not part of it. And I think I might have heard my name over there. So I'm praying for me. I mean, <laughs> and it really, it, it, it feels a bit dangerous, but we're seeing, man, that's a huge area. The second area is, is obviously evangelism. Um, that's just a weak, weak area. We, we make it an outreach, like bring your friends so that you know, uh, somebody can share Christ, which is good. I'm for that. But we have to turn our youth leaders from quarterbacks to coaches to where they're not just saying, hey, bring your friends and watch me throw the touchdown pass. But I'm going to throw you. I'm going to teach you to throw the touchdown pass every day of the week. You know, sure, bring your friends on Wednesday night, but I'm going to train you on for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday to have these gospel conversations. Yeah, I love that. Let's dig in a little more on um, the relational evangelism, the gospel conversation piece, because I know that's that's uh, one of the pieces that, that um, you and your team at Dare to Share really, really champions. And it's, it's one of those pieces where uh, I feel like whether it's in youth ministry or even in, you know, the, the, the wider church, um, sometimes that is something that's shied away from to a degree, even from leaders, um, you know, they, they feel almost like, ah, you know, uh, that, that's something that's going to be challenging to introduce, you know, no one in this day and age is going to, you know, engage in that type of a thing. And, and so they, they put up some, some obstacles themselves, probably mentally. Talk to us a little bit about how you, how Dare to Share, um, how, how God has kind of led your ministry to really embrace this idea of relational evangelism and and what are you guys doing that is is making it so effective um for for young people that maybe even those of us who are you know out of high school now could learn from as well yeah that's a great question i think you know one of the things we got to remember jesus said you know if you're ashamed of me and my words i'm going to be ashamed of you i mean you think about that that's kind (laughs) of should freak us out a little bit and the primary call that Jesus gave us, you know, our, our, our mission is to make disciples. You cannot make a disciple without evangelism. You know, uh, that's how it starts. And, uh, it really is square one. 
when it comes to, you know, advancing the kingdom. We pray for the lost, we care for the lost, and we share the gospel out loud with words, you know. And I know the quote that's been attributed, some say falsely, to St. Francis, you know, preach the gospel if necessary, use words. Mm-hmm. I, I kind of turn that a little bit. Preach the gospel, it's necessary, use words. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. We, we of course, we want to demonstrate the gospel, I mean, I mean, who's nobody's going to want to listen to us if we're not loving them and caring for them. But we don't want to hide behind demonstrating the gospel and not articulating it because there's power in the words of the gospel message. I don't know how God infused power into a stick to open up the Red Sea that Moses used. I don't know how God infused power into a set of propositions, a message that opens up closed hearts for us to articulate, but it do, it works. It worked. We heard the gospel. We believed. How will they hear without a preacher? We have to articulate it. So the question is, how do we do that? So here's how we train teenagers to do that. And it's something I've trained adults in as well. Three words, ask, admire, admit. So ask questions. Uh, get to know somebody. Um, if it's your neighbor, get to know them better. You know, uh, let them talk. Get to know. Turn it towards spiritual things. You know, maybe one of the questions is: Is there any way I can pray for you? It's interesting how people just open up when you ask them that question. Uh, I've had even I've heard even atheists that would say, "I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God." But yeah, you can pray for this because right, there's right. something like that right. Yeah. And then admire what you can about what they believe or where they're at. Find common ground like Paul did in Acts 17. And then admit the reason you're a Christian is you're so messed up, you need Jesus to save you. And and then then you're in a position where you can articulate the gospel. But I've done that. Uh, I mean, be honest with you, I took my daughter to Disneyland yesterday. It was her birthday. I was on a tram, and I began to ask, admire, admit with Jerry behind me. And we had a great conversation, found out he was a believer already. So I trained him how to share his faith. And, um, you know encourage him to do that as well. But I think we want to make it conversational, uh, but we got to get at some point to the message of the gospel because in it lies the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And I think the church has lost its belief in the fundamental power and awe in the fundamental of power of God unleashed through the gospel message. And it I, I talked to some Christians that seem too sophisticated for that. I'm like, dude, this is what we're called to be about. This is the message that saved us. We have to lovingly engage, but we have to articulate that message. Yeah, I, I love that. One of the things that you you touch on in your book, Gospelize Your Youth Ministry, and uh, you talk about and, and, and preach and teach and coach is – this idea that every gospel conversation, when we look at the book of Acts, right, every gospel conversation was an act of love. And, um, you know, that, that's what's birthed out of. And one of the things that I think we, we uh, struggle with is that we live in a society where we feel, you know, like the, the more loving thing is to be more open and more tolerant and not to kind of interject our beliefs or opinions on someone. And it seems like we are, as a culture, we, we've, we've kind of come to that place. Um, mm-hmm. how, how, how can we recapture that idea that, man, gospel, sharing gospel conversations is really, um, is really true love? Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree that that's what's happened with this culture. And sadly, it's really spilled into the church. And I... You know, the illustration I use, if I see, you know, a little girl running toward the street and I, I need to do what it takes to stop her uh, because, you know, I care about her. And I feel like the church has lost its urgency of really what I t- what I call um, rescuing others from the hell they're headed to and the hell they're going through right now. Mm. Um yeah, there's eternal separation from God, uh, and yes, there's earthly separation from God. I I don't know how people make it in this life without a relationship with Jesus Christ. Be honest with you, it's hard even with a relationship with Jesus Christ. Right. Apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ, I mean, I can't even imagine going through this life without the hope of heaven, 
without the knowledge of a heavenly father in my life that he's sovereign, that he cares about me, man, it is an act of unlove not to articulate the message to the people God has placed in our world. And I don't know if you ever saw that uh, Penn and Gillette video from Penn who was approached by a Gideon. He's a, he's a, um, an atheist, Penn Gillette. Yeah. Uh, he's an atheist and he was approached by a Gideon who tried to share Christ with him. And he goes, dude, this guy is just trying to show love to me. He goes, how much you have to hate somebody to believe in the gospel and not share Christ with them? He goes, if I really thought that people are going to go to hell without Jesus, I'd tell everybody. And, and I mean, he articulated in such a bold way the truth that if we're not articulating the gospel, man, it is not an act of love at all. And if we really care about people, we're not just going to take care of their physical needs. We're going to take care of their spiritual needs. And we're going to open our mouth and risk our social equity for the sake. And another way to put that is we're going to pick up our cross, die to ourselves, and follow Jesus. Yeah, yeah, that, that's so good, brother. So well articulated, I think, and and really appreciate your your heart. Talk to us a little bit. Um, uh, it's been great to have this conversation, but as we kind of close it down, tell us a little bit. I know that uh, Dare to Share, uh, you have lots of, of um, opportunities, lots of resources available. Um, how can people learn more, or, or what do you have available for those who are listening? Well, yeah, actually, October 12th, we do Dare to Share Live in 100-plus sites across the United States. It's a live simulcast where we'll be training and equipping thousands, maybe tens of thousands of teams uh, how to share the gospel. We'll inspire, equip. We've got vertical worship. We've got skit guys. It's going to be great. It's going to be a party. But the party is in every one of the satellite sites because there's bands there and trainers there. And just really encourage, uh, if you know any youth, uh, go to daretoshare.live.org or get your youth leader involved. Or if you're a youth leader, get involved. Uh, you can actually get a stream straight to your youth group if there's not a satellite site close to you. But it's just dare, the number two, daretoshare.live.org. Also, uh, if you want to download a free version of my book, uh, Gospelize Your Youth Ministry, you can go to the daretoshare.org store and just and look for Gospelize and fill out the info and you can download it. And let's check out the tools. We have a Life in Six Words app. We've got all sorts of tools and resources, uh, most of them free to really help uh, youth leaders. But we also have a lot of pastors hijacking our stuff for the church. <laughs> Which we love. That's awesome, brother. And we, I love the resources you guys put together. Love, love the ministry and what God has been doing um, through it for for many, many years. And you just keep pushing forward. You keep pushing forward. And uh, and I just absolutely love that. Admire what uh, you and, and the entire team at Dare to Share are doing. So thank you so much for being with us. We will have links to um, all of that information. Uh, in the show notes. So if you're listening in and would like to to learn more, you can go to the show notes and click through. But uh, brother, Greg, it was so good to have you with us. I appreciate you, my friend. I appreciate it and uh, encourage everybody to set your watch for 1012, your phone alarm, and pray with us between now and October 12th that God would do a mighty work on that day with this next generation. Amen. God bless you, my friend. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate you taking the time to be with us on this week's episode. Every week as we are putting the episodes together, we're thinking of you, our pastors and ministry leaders, and striving to provide insightful and inspiring interviews as you seek to grow as a kingdom leader. So we hope you're finding value from the Church Leaders Podcast. And if so, we'd certainly appreciate you taking a few moments to head over to iTunes and leave us a review. Your positive reviews and ratings help other church leaders more easily find our podcasts so they too can benefit from these interviews. Again, we thank you in advance, and if you have any comments, any questions, suggestions, or ideas for guests, I would love to hear from you. You can send me an email to podcast at churchleaders.com, or you can connect with me on Twitter. Finally, you can find this podcast as well as other great faith-based podcasts on the Faith Play app. It's available for both Apple and Android, and so we encourage you to check that out as well. So until next time, this is Jason Day encouraging you to love well, and lead well. You've been listening to the Church Leaders Podcast. For articles, videos, and free resources that will help you lead better every day, visit our website at churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening.